Hello, so it's with a great trepidation that I wade into one of the great political debates of our time. Caged or three notes per string? Caged and three notes per string are two common strategies for mapping out scales on the fretboard and positions and that kind of thing. Um, I should say that neither of these are particularly traditional ways to map out scales. Um, the position system, for instance, simply refers to the fret that your first finger is on, and the most positions we might tend to stay very much in the same area the next. So, for instance, if I play a G major scale, I'm obviously staying in that area of the neck and using, in the classical style, one finger per fret. Of course, jazz guitarists, um, that, that for instance is the second position, right? So jazz guitarists don't really think of scales, I don't think, in the same way as classical guitarists. I think uh, in classical guitar, the main aim is to try and get uh, positions under your fingers so that you can sight read things easily and that you have some kind of framework for understanding guitar neck. And that, we are not that different, but I think um, jazz guitarists tend to map the neck differently and also jazz guitarists are very interested in harmony. And that's where caged comes in. So caged is kind of a system which I think a lot of guitarists have used, uh, jazz guitarists, since uh, you know, the early days. And uh, for those who don't know what it is, it's when you have the basic, uh, in this case, C-A-G-E-D, basic sort of open chords. C-A-G-E-D. And it so happens that they kind of go in order up the neck. So for instance, C, if I do an A shape, bar shape here, that's an A shape, so C-A, then the G comes here. That's a, I don't think many people play that very often. An E shape and then a D shape. Okay, and that's all C major, obviously. So um, in a, in a caged understanding of the neck, what we would do is we'd actually build our scales around these chord shapes. Okay. Yeah. You know, and so on, right? So this has, I think, for the uh, jazz guitarist, a few advantages, uh, most obvious of which is that we can actually relate things to chords. So for instance, if I play G, sorry, C, <laughs> I can't even name chords anymore, D minor seven, G altered, C major seventh, I can use, for instance, the C shape here, the E shape here, I mean, the system works with both scales and arpeggios, right? And, you know, the uh, the A shape. And you can do your stuff uh, over the chords and very much have that thing in mind. You can even, of course, as I've said in various videos, simply arpeggio chord shapes as well. So that intimate relationship between chords and scales is something I think very useful for straight ahead jazz when we're, uh, you know, really starting with these kind of conventional, you know, drop voicings, things like this, you know. These kind of shapes that you learn early on. And then, you know, obviously some of the more kind of advanced or unusual voicings that we might use. Um, E easily also fit into this kind of framework. So it's kind of a, a useful way of understanding the neck if you, you know, play a lot of chords. And uh, obviously straight ahead jazz has a has a lot of chords in it. And a few other things that I sort of notice about this is that um, you can play it very easily using a sort of more pronated, by which I mean sort of slanted hand position. So you can, uh, you can play like in a more classical posture with your hand more sort of parallel if you like, to the neck. But then most players um, who play like blues and rock and stuff have a pronated hand actually, and especially players with larger hands. Um, so in jazz, it's kind of a mixture, but you often see players playing a bit more like this, such as Peter Bernstein, Kurt Rosenwinkel, um, uh, historically people like Wes Montgomery, uh, Grant Green, Charlie Christian, uh, even like Jimmy Rainey played with a pronated hand, uh, even though, you know, it's often connected with like a three fingered approach to fingering. But it's not necessarily that isn't a way that you have to do it. You can use your little finger, it's just that the little finger is somewhat disadvantaged. It's less, uh, less of an equal to the other digits when you've got your hand slanted like that. Okay? Um, 
And uh, the other thing that is worth pointing out for the right hand is that um, these kind of more traditional positions that might start on the second finger and not go up and down the neck too much tend to uh, create an irregularity in the picking hand. So for instance, if I just do like thirds. You know, it kind of gets a bit awkward up there. Um, or... You get like little, um, you know, uh, very similar if I just got the scale. Yeah. You'd have a, a, like a break, with, uh, you know, um, on the B and A, uh, sorry, B and G strings where you have like two notes instead of three, so on the B string. And that can muck up your right hand if, if, if you're not used to dealing with that. Okay, so it's not a very symmetrical way to play the guitar, but you end up with an octave here. Okay, and um, I think in the end, you know, people sort of end up, this is kind of the way I learned, by the way, is you kind of end up joining your shapes together. So you can get up and down the neck easily enough. Um, the only thing that happens, I think, a little bit from my my sort of learning is that sometimes he's kind of in between positions on the G position there, particularly the G position, also the C position a little bit, but particularly the G position get a little bit neglected, simply because you know you don't I don't play so many voicings in that position. You know this is not really a terribly useful voicing of a um, major seventh chord, for instance. You know so because of that I, I tend to sort of maybe gloss over this this kind of position here, which means that there's a bit of a gap sometimes between the A and the, the A and the E. So you have to take steps to make sure you're not doing that and make sure you practice your G position. I mean, that, that, that's what I found anyway. Okay, so the three notes system. Um, generally, I think players who use this tend to have a more aligned hand. So a hand where all the digits are kind of equal. Uh, you don't have to do that to play three notes of string sort of fretboard mapping. But um, I think most of the players that I think of who use it do do this. Um, so uh, for instance, if I take this G major scale, you can hopefully appreciate that there are indeed three notes of string, which is hence its name. So uh, there's a few things like, I'm moving the position of my first finger as I go up. So um, it's not really one position, but kind of a connected set of positions if you're looking at it from a classical perspective. Um, there's a few advantages with this. First of all, there's a larger range. We're going up uh, two octaves and a fourth, as opposed to just, you know, two octaves and a bit. Um, two octaves, kind of a two octaves and a second, I guess, with the, uh, you know, traditional fingering. We're getting that. So we get a couple of extra notes at the top, which is useful. Um, it's very symmetrical. So I always, thought of this as being a shred thing because it really kind of um, optimizes the left right hand picking for instance if I can just go up the scale it's it's you know if I get my hand coordination together which is a big if <laughs> there's basically no sort of uh, upper limit to how fast I can make that work because the pick goes down down up down and it goes sweeps onto the next string all the way over so it's very it's a very kind of it's a way that is very friendly to the picking hand especially if you do two-way economies or sweep picking like Frank Gambale for instance um, but actually this uh, I think it is a shred thing but actually um, uh, many jazz guitarists do play this way and Warren Nunes for instance is a famous teacher who's quite famous for teaching three notes of string position. So they obviously have some advantages. Now, um, uh, also, uh, it's quite familiar from legato players like um, Joe Satriani and Alan Holdsworth. I mean, forgive me, I've got gauge 13 strings on this guitar, so it's, <laughs> it's not so easy to do that stuff. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, you probably know what I mean from, from your own sort of uh, experiences with the guitar and listening and so on. So um, I, I think this works very well as an intervallic approach. For instance, if I play like thirds. It 
actually just regularizes the right hand, so it's always just like down, up, down, up. So sorry, it's always the same number of notes of string, so. You can see I just use alternate picking all the way through, and it, there's no break in the pattern, it's always the same. The only slight uh, sticking point is making sure that you, you know, play the right intervals with this hand, but then a lot of people who use three notes of string fingerings find it easier to adopt what's called uniform force tuning, um, where these two notes are sort of raised a half step, or, uh, and, and then you can, um, you, you have a more compact position, um, and, and the, the intervals are always consistent across the neck. Um, but if you're doing that, I think you're starting to move away from the traditional language of the guitar, which has a lot of, you know, unison open strings and so on, and moving much towards creating, almost treating it more like a keyboard instrument. I think of this being a very modern way of playing, and certainly for intervals, this kind of stuff is great. You know, if you just, you know, if you like to play like tone clusters or anything like that, like these kind of voicings where you go through those scales. I think it's a really good way to finger things. So I'll always associate it with more modern styles. People like, you know, obviously Tim Miller, um, uh, Alan Holdsworth, and so on and so forth, you know, seem to use this kind of way of mapping the fretboard. And their their style of playing obviously isn't sort of straight ahead jazz, you know, so. By the way, speaking of Alan Holdsworth, there's a bit of a mystique about the four notes of string thing. Um, I don't think Alan used four notes of string that much in his playing, as far as I can tell. I think he was mostly a three notes of string guy. Um, uh, but um, in his famous sort of uh, instructional VHS back in those days when they had VHS videos, um, when we had VHS videos, I remember those days, uh, he talks about the four notes of string thing, and I think he's really talking about it as an exercise of fretboard mapping. So for instance, if I've got a G major scale, one way of getting it all over the net so I can map from top bottom to top without any break is uh, just by kind of taking the lowest note in the key of G on the guitar, which is an E. You can do this for any scale, right? You can do it for like, um, you know, f a melodic minor, uh, messe en mode three, whole tone, half whole, anything you can think of, right? You can do this for any any scale, but we'll just do it with the major because it's a familiar sound and it's uh, a lot easier to tell when you've mucked up <laughs> as well. Okay, so we'll go from a low E, we're just gonna go four notes of string, so. And B on the next string, then this F sharp on the next string, we're starting from uh, C on the next one, and then uh, we're going down to, well we're on that note there is a F sharp, so we're going to start on G on this string, sorry about the tuning, then coming down, down so I mean obviously that gets us from all the way down there all the way up here so it's a very good I mean that's basically all of my fretboard probably not all of Alan's fretboard <laughs> but certainly all of mine so it's a very good exercise for just getting all over the neck and learning the notes all over the neck I mean there's other ways of doing it um, I like a exercise where you explore different routes Might be four notes of string, might be five notes of string, six notes of string, and then one note on other strings. I mean, you could do something crazy like this. You know, go to D. You know, why would you do it that way? Well, just to sort of learn. And then, of course, you know, you have things like uh, uh, open string over rings. So, for instance, if I wanted to play um, a G major scale with open string over ring, for that, E, D. E, uh, e, D, uh, C, B, yeah, that kind of thing. So that, that that is probably very unfamiliar to a lot of people. So what I'm trying to say, I think, is that it's a really good way uh, to practice scales um, to sort of use one of these basic positions when you're getting it together, when you're learning your muscle memory for scales. If you don't know your scales in all positions, 
Just pick something that suits your kind of way of thinking and the way your hand is set up. It can be caged or three notes of string or traditional classical positions and just practice your scales in positions up and down the neck. But once you've got that, it's really good, I mean, to break out of that. So four notes of string is one way to do that. Um, you've got these lovely, you know, they're so beautiful sounding, I think. You know, and, and a bit messes with your head trying to work because you're so used to kind of thinking of scales along the, the thing. Uh, to think of them as jumping between stop notes and open strings is really, is really quite difficult at first. Um, and then, you know, you can also think of things like, you know, scales along one string. So instance, the G major on the G string is an obvious way to start that, but then also got to start thinking about them on other strings as well. You know, be able to play all of your scales along all of the strings, across the neck, um, you know, two notes of string, four notes of string, three notes of string, anything you can think of, because you know, do it with one finger even, you know, just like four notes of string with one finger. Because then you'll stop thinking about it as being a fingering, you start thinking about it being as a note, you know, on, on the neck, right? You know, and so on, right? So that way you build up a really thorough knowledge of where all the notes are. And it takes ages, but five minutes of it a day, and it will help. So yeah, just to sum up, um, pick something, be consistent at it, but when you've learned it, start to move beyond the positions and into the wider space of the neck. Um, hope that's helpful, thanks for watching.